our first special guest. We're going to hear a little bit about him, and then he will come out, and then we'll meet our second. Rich Lamb. Rich Lamb, everybody. Of an award-winning reporter with WCBS News Radio 880. 36 years he'll celebrate uh, next week, February 26th. He's done it all. I mean, you know, we hear him. He's a part of sort of the soundtrack, if you will, of our lives. Won all sorts of awards, Overseas Press Club, the Associated Press, UPI, New York Press Club, Archdiocese of New York, all kinds of different organizations' awards. He's also covered the big stories in this big city, 78, uh, an 88-day newspaper strike, one of the nation's mainstays in the transit strikes in both uh, 1980 and 2000. He covered the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center and, of course, 9-11. He's covered four major plane crashes that have affected our area. All of the races for mayor, governors, presidential elections since two uh, 1978. In 2005, he traveled to Rome to cover the funeral of Pope John Paul II. In 2013, Rich joined the CBS network radio team to cover the conclave electing Pope Francis, and so much more. Let's take a listen, because this is what is so exciting about being here tonight in this crazy, crazy world, the power of words, and boy, this man masters it. Let's listen to Rich Lamb. There he is, Bill de Blasio, the lanky six-foot-five mayor-elect of New York City. On stage with him, the rest of the now familiar first family of New York City. His wife, Shirlane McRae, daughter Kiara, and son Dante, with his trademark afro. Go with the fro became a catchphrase in this campaign, and New York City's voters have certainly gone with it big time. People are waving, standing on their feet, cheering, and he is up there on stage with his wife, Winnie, accepting a thunderous accolade. At this very moment, Melba Moore yeah! is singing Lift Every Voice and Sing. People are swaying gently, rhythmically rocking back and forth, hand in hand, in a vo very moving and emotional moment here. It is just a scene of great magnificence and majesty. We're looking at the face of, of St. Peter's Basilica, which is bathed in light, the statues of the, the saints atop it, and, and the great lantern atop, atop the, the Capitol Dome there uh, behind it. And, and then the arms of Bernini, which stretch out uh, around the crowd, embracing the crowd, and they are supposed to symbolically embrace the world. Uh, there's a great celebration here. The people are uh, cold and wet, but uh, their hearts are warm. It's an it's absolutely uh, a magnificent scene. A great pomp and ceremony uh, going on now, and that will continue to escalate uh, as, uh, as they wait now for the identity of the Pope to be revealed from behind the maroon curtain. Please welcome, wasn't that great, Rich Lamb. Listen to that. What do we do? What do we do now? Now we sit, and we're going to hear a little bit more. Please have a seat, Mr. Lamb. Okay. You want Charlie to sit there? And you want me to sit Whatever there? you would like. Up to you. Put Whatever you would like. Let's put Charlie in the middle. All right. Our second wonderful guest this afternoon, uh, another true storyteller, Charles Osgood. He has been referred to for a long, long time as a CBS News poet in residence. He's been anchor of the CBS News program Sunday morning since 1994. He also anchors and writes the Osgood file. I heard this morning talking about other worldly places uh, and that daily news commentary broadcast for CBS Radio Network. In 1997, he received a, night, a George Foster Peabody Award for Sunday morning and two additional Peabody Awards for his 1990, pardon me, 1985 and 86 for Newsmark. He received his third Emmy, no, Emmy Award in 1997 for his work and interview with the American realist painter Andrew Wyeth for Sunday Morning. Osgood is the 2010 recipient of AFTRA Foundation's Amy Lifetime Achievement in Broadcasting Award. He's the recipient of the 2005 Paul White Award presented by Radio and Television News Directors Association for his lifetime contributions to electronic journalism. He also received the Walter Cronkite Excellence in Journalism Award Award from Arizona State New University. Um, 
I could go on and on and on. This man has a lot of, uh, com uh, pardon me, awards. He's also the author of seven books. His latest, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the White House, Humor, Blunders, and Other Oddities from the Presidential Campaign Trail. Please welcome a part of all of our Sunday mornings, I think we can all attest to that, Charles Osgood. For a while and I'll put it down for a while. We'll we're going to need it later. We'll pick that up when we're ready. So, gentlemen. Can I explain this? Uh, would you like to now? Why? No, I'll, I'll explain it later. Okay. Well, first, let's, <laughs> let's just ad-lib the whole evening as we are, which is what these two guys are so natural and so giving in what you do. You make it seem so easy. First of all, just tell me why you certainly get invited to a lot of different things, Charles. Why tonight? Why here at Baruch and the SAG Foundation event? Sort of depends on who asks you, and Rich Lamb asked me, so I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think this is the first uh, sort of joint uh, SAG after uh, with, with, with this being one mm -hmm, union now, mm -hmm. and so. It's, it's my outfit. You gotta. You gotta <laughs> it's the bow tie. Yeah, yeah. How long? Bow tie has been ever since we've seen you on uh, CBS News, or did that start earlier than that? It was before I started doing very much television. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I was replacing Roger Mudd on a on a on a Saturday evening news, and I was wearing a a, a clip-on bow tie, <laughs> and and one of the one of the writers said to me, never, never, never do that. I said, I don't know how to tie one. <laughs> so he took me into the men's room and, and taught me how to tie <laughs> a bow tie, how to tie his, because he was wearing one at the time. And uh, that, that was it. I, I, I got hooked. You, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but <laughs> if he learns one, he wants to do it all. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we love that about you, because that is just one of your many signatures, your look. Rich, tell us why tonight. You said yes. I'm the shop steward. <laughs> <laughs> Was it like that? <laughs> you know, Charlie mentioned SAG after, and I saw three management people from CBS applauding. <laughs> That's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a good union member. Um, you know, I grew up in a family in which my, my uncle Jim, my uncle Jim Tully, was uh, the business manager of the iron workers in the state of Connecticut. And Jim talked like that. He'd walk in the house, he'd scare you with his voice, and then he'd put his hand around your whole arm. And he, was, he was a huge guy, but he taught me uh, a lot about labor history and about how uh, unions have really made uh, America a better place, at least from a... From a non-management viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we talk about storytelling, and, and everyone wants to know, like, when first did you know this was what you wanted to do? You grew up born in the Bronx, raised in the Baltimore area. That's right. And so, <laughs> yay, Maryland. Um, so, so even as, as, a, as a young boy, I mean, where did this gift emanate from? We moved when I was in the first grade to, to Baltimore, so I really spent my grammar school years there. And I was a baseball fan from the time that I could remember, and I was a Baltimore Orioles fan. They were not even a major league team at that time. Oh. They were in the International League. And there was a guy by the name of Bill Dyer who worked out of a little booth at the, uh, at the, at the stadium, and he would wave his chair out the window when the, when, when the birds did. So they called him the birds back in those days, too. And I decided that I wanted to be Bill Dyer. Ah. And I thought, this has got to be the most fun and the best, the, 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 anything that they, they actually get, get paid for. It. So then I was there you know, for the rest of my uh, uh, grammar school years, elementary school years, and then we moved to Baltimore, to Philadelphia. But I always I had this idea that I, I would like to be in radio. Then when, when uh, I, I, by the way, my uh, the football coach at St. Cecilia's was Vince Lombardi. 
So, so I tell people when they, uh, when, they, when they, everybody's talking about the Super Bowl, I usually say uh, they're vying for a, a, a trophy that has the name of my old high school football coach on it. <laughs> I was I was not there when he was the coach, but he was he was a strong memory, and his brother oh, taught physics course. there. Of course, in 1967, joining uh, CBS Radio, um, and and being able to fulfill that dream, you wanted to be that person telling the such an interesting thing to work for this incredibly reputable company. Was it daunting for you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I had worked at ABC for a while, just to warm up for the <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, uh, my last name, you should know, is Wood. It's not Osgood. But uh, my middle name is, is Osgood. And when I got, it, when I got the job at, uh, at ABC, they already had an announcer, a member of AFTRA, by the name of Charles Woods. So they said, you know, we'd like to hire you, but we can't have, and he was also doing newscasts. They were doing that at the time, occasional radio newscast would be done by the staff announcers. So they couldn't have a Charles Wood and a Charles Woods, and so Charles Osgood was born. Ah. <laughs> and I, and it, it, it works out better for me anyway, because uh, if I make a mistake, it's always Charles Osgood. It did, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, in um, your early work in radio was not in news, right? Your first jobs? Well, um, yes, it, it actually, there was about two weeks at the University of Detroit where I tried to be a disc jockey. I realized I couldn't think of anything to say after every record. I don't it believe was, that. It was so boring. <laughs> it was awful. And then, you know, you had to queue up the records and, and try to remember what to play, and I started throwing them down on the floor, and then you back over them with the chair, and you say, this is, <laughs> this is not for me. So then I thought, well, I'm going to do news, <laughs> you know. But I was always interested in it, so in answer to the question you asked before, I started out in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, listening to WTIC, uh, and uh, a guy named Bob Steele, who owned the market, but he was a great storyteller. This guy had characters that he would do, and he would read these long poems on the air in Morning Drive, and he owned the place. I mean, he really owned the market, and I thought, wow. You know, if I could ever get on the radio, I had no idea how you did that, you know? How do you go from being a little kid to being on the radio? It just doesn't make any sense at all. So one time, Bob Steele was doing a soapbox derby, and he was announcing it live. Now, I had seen statues of Jesus in church, but then I saw a statue of, I saw Bob Steele in the flesh at, at, at this soapbox derby, and I said, wow. I guess, I guess he's real, and you actually can get out and do that. So mm. that was my inspiration. It was a great radio station. Terrific. It still is a great radio station. Up there. We own that, don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> How hard is radio? I listen to you every day, and I'm always, and I hear you too, of course, on, on news radio. And so I'm... I'm Listening to how you describe things, we heard we're going to watch some of your work in just a moment, but radio, the gift of being able to describe and to convey a story in a short amount of time, tell me about that challenge, Rich. It's all about the words. It's about the writing, you know. I think that uh, Charles Osgood said it best once, you know, that radio is the most visual medium. Mm. It really is. Uh, and you can create a word picture in your mind. That don't think of a yellow canary. You know, I mean, it's the oldest line in the book, but you know, you, when you paint a picture with words, somehow everybody has a different picture in his or her mind. Especially if it's preceded by don't. Right. <laughs> right. You know, you say hippopotamus. Right. You just painted a hippopotamus. That's why, that's why by the way, why I say I'll see you, see on, the you on the radio at the end of the broadcast today. And, and tell, tell me more then about that, about what the words mean to you when you're. You know, we, we're not sitting at home going, well, he only has 30 seconds well, to you know, do that. I have nothing against television, as you know. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I really do believe that, that radio is more visual than television hmm. because it, the picture is created in the mind of the listener. Mm -hmm. And television gives you a picture. So there it is. You don't have to think of a picture, so mm -hmm. you don't. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Serling, the guy who did, used to do the Twilight Zone. Rod, Rod Serling? Rod Serling. Rod. Mm -hmm. The Twilight so Zone. When, you, when he was working in radio, 
He'd say, once you, you could write, once there was a castle on a hill and a million castles would be built in a minute, in a second. In television, you write, once there was a castle on a hill and a guy wearing a belt with some tools on it comes in and says, what kind of a castle do you want? <laughs> right. Because you're only going to get one. <laughs> right. So, right. So that's what I, th I think radio, then, you know, certainly creates more pictures mm -hmm. than television mm -hmm. does because television is so literal. I worked in radio uh, at the beginning of my career, and it was really hard, but boy, did I love the challenge, and I learned so much uh, on an AM station in Columbus, Ohio. Let's take a look at some of your work on your other half of your job. CBS Sunday Morning, Charles Osgood. See, I told you television is no good. <laughs> I'm Charles Osgood on the CBS Radio Network. Radio, the theater of the mind. I've worked some years in radio and television. American radio of the 1940s had a profound influence on me. It's the reason I'm doing what I do today instead of playing the organ at a skating rink. I could imagine no career more delightful, except perhaps to play shortstop for the Orioles. The Osgood File, Charles Osgood on the CBS Radio Network. See you on the radio. I say that every week, a peculiar phrase some people think for anyone to speak. I'll see you on the radio. I can, you see. I can. Tape is rolling. Good evening. This is the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Charles Osgood. In Paris, in what is being called the art theft of the century. Charles, nobody has ever been welcomed as genuinely as you are welcomed here. Well, thank you, Charles. A real honor to succeed you, not replace you on this broadcast. Nobody could replace you. I was the announcer for the United States Army Band. And each concert began with a flourish and a fanfare. <laughs> you know, loud. And it f just about frightened me off the stage. I mean, my heart just went Whoa, like that. And then, of course, the, the, the brass cutting through. So naturally, standing there in the studio when I heard the horns uh, heralding the beginning of Sunday morning, I thought, I've been here before. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Charles Osgood, and this is Sunday morning. I know it sounds strange to me, too. But here we are. Hit it! Is that a banjo? Uh, That's a banjo. Oh, it is. Listen, uh, I didn't realize that you, that you played banjo. Well, you, you know, it's a photograph, so we can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Who would turn down an opportunity to appear with one of the most beloved choirs in the world? With the tempting aroma of fresh baked ham, sweet potatoes, and pecan pie drifting out of the kitchen. Did you imagine that you were a natural for television when you first started doing that show? Well, I think I'm a natural ham, but it helps a lot. <laughs> Serve yourself. Thank you. So never let the kitchen fool you. Just follow the advice of Julia. She gave us for so many years. Did you care for another? And banishing all kitchen fears. A Thanksgiving toast from you and me to Julia Child. Bon appetit. Special Sunday morning, one we're spending in the suburbs, the island nation of Cuba. And this is where accuracy in journalism really comes in. Try not to get it in the bushes or on the roof. That's about right. Come on to my house, my house, I'm gonna give you candy. Which I understand you didn't want to do. No. Well, it was the dumbest song. Mastering the art of friendship is one of the secrets of a fulfilling life no matter who you are. The two artists were putting away their brushes. The old quip was it takes two people to paint a picture, one guy to paint it and the other guy to hit him over the head when it's time to stop. Yeah, really. But there's... In this case, I was that other guy. And you might have noticed, the subject this day was me. You never painted your father, did you? Oh, no. And I think that was a great tragedy in my life when he was killed, but I hadn't done it. And it, uh, it changed my whole outlook on portraiture. Feeling that you shouldn't let the... Well, really, away. when you know something and feel it and have a love for it, my God, do it. Don't let it go by.
Please join us again next Sunday morning. Until then, I'll see you on the radio. Bring back memories just seeing all those. I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little bit of every part of your life there. Which was that great. only four minutes? It felt like about 25. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was only four minutes. Um, Julia Child, what was she like? Oh, she was a fabulous, fabulous person. And mm -hmm. She's very, very kind. And, and she, this, this, this was in her home in the... Uh, uh, a suburb of uh, Boston, mm -hmm. and she, she she could not have been uh, nicer. And I and I and I she taught me that day how to sh prepare garlic shrimp. All right. So that's the only thing I really know how to cook. <laughs> but our family has every Thanksgiving, we have uh, spare ribs and sauerkraut. That is an old Baltimore tradition. Ah. It used to be a very German town, hmm. and. And the other thing is garlic shrimp. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Ever since we did that, did that thing. One of the things that um, uh, stands out to me is, is the pace, how you speak in, in local news. We're talking so quickly. Uh, I try to slow that down myself because that's not how I am in person. And I don't think that's how people want to be spoken to, you know? So, but especially the way you, you have this unique style and it's, it's so important to that show. It fits everything. You know, people used to tell me when I first started doing television that you know, you're not doing it the way you do on radio. Mm. And I would say, I think, as far as I know, I am. I don't know of anything different than I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I had been on radio and only radio for a very long time, and they had an idea in their heads as to what I was supposed to look like. <laughs> when they found out, they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That, I, think, I think that's really true, mm -hmm. because people expect certain, uh, to have a certain response, and people thought that I was, I don't know, they may have thought I was older, or they thought I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but anyway, it's a, I, I think it's one of those differences. The audience can see you on television, and they imagine you on, mm -hmm. on radio. That's another great advantage if you look like I did. Mm -hmm. oh. I just have a face for radio. Oh, no, 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 no. But you may have noticed that I am now younger than I was when some of those pictures were being taken. <laughs> Mario I, Cuomo once said to me that I had a face for radio. <laughs> Mario Cuomo said that. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that for a while. Well, I mean, it's just one of those things, you know? Some people are blessed with um, a certain look. Mm -hmm. You have it. I don't. You do <laughs> have a face for radio. I'm willing to believe it. <laughs> when we were coming no. in here, we were th these two gentlemen were talking about being altar boys at a time in their lives. Rich, as I said earlier, has covered uh, the popes and the conclaves and just so much. And we heard your radio report there from St. Peter's Square. Um, it is interesting, I find, when we can do things that have meaning for us, uh, as well as, of course, being a journalist telling the, the full story. Tell me about that work for you. Well, Rich. you know, I, be, um, I began, I was an altar boy back when they had the Latin Mass. If that gives you some idea. I can still say the Sushipia. Uh, Deum quilitificat, you went to the man. I remember that one. Remember. Sushipia Dominus Sacrificium de Mani Bistui. I guess you didn't expect this, did you? <laughs> Pater Noster, Quius and Chalice, never mind. I'm an Episcopalian, I'll be leaving now. <laughs> and people well, are you, leaving. You guys won, now we do it in English. So. <laughs> what about Pig Latin? You want to do that next? Or? <laughs> Ex-nay. I weigh out nay. I, I, I used to do the Mass from the Blue Chapel at, uh, at uh, Fordham uh, back when, uh, when I was at WFUV. Oh. I left, out, left that out for the four, for the four years that I w was at Fordham, Fordham College. I walked on the campus and I looked up and there was this antenna on the top of Keating Hall. It's not there anymore. But I said, it's a radio station. So I went up there, I thought it might be fun. And it was so much fun that I not only spent the school year, but summers I would, I would go in. And uh, it, it, was, it was there that I really 
learned how much how much fun it was. By the way, w, what they would do is they would you know put you in a studio and say, okay, you're on. Sometimes I played the piano. Uh, there was a, a show called The Woodpile, as I've told you, I was a, a wood. <laughs> and uh, so, so I would tr try to figure out what key a record was mm -hmm. so that I could do a pi noodle on the piano and, and lead into that record. Mm. One of many tricks that I learned at, <laughs> at WFUV, but that station has now gotten ever so much better uh, since they got rid of me, uh, they, they really, really, it's now it's now one of the top stations. Really, it, that is a huge audience, and it's it, it used to be like an activity. You, know, mm -hmm. you would go there and you d you did it, uh, not not so much for the benefit of the audience, although mm -hmm. th th that's supposed to be what you're what you're doing. But there, I did learn something about uh, talking into a microphone. Mm -hmm. I, I I never took a a journalism course at Fordham, although they had a fine journalism department. I never took uh, a, a writing course uh, there. Uh, people say, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but in fact, I, I majored in economics. And the irony is that now, whenever there's a Sunday morning devoted to you know, it, the, the business issue, Anthony Mason gets yeah, to do that show. They get somebody I else to that. do it. <laughs> You know, I, 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 it just occurs to me that we're both products of Jesuit educations. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the University of Detroit. And, uh, but the first radio station I ever worked at wasn't, not ne wasn't nearly as civilized as the one. I worked at WEXL Royal Oak, and our slogan was, <laughs> really? <laughs> Hillbilly and proud of it. <laughs> and... Uh, there were bullet holes in the front of the building where they used to have the studio. Guys would uh, shoot at the disc jockeys if they didn't like the record that was on, so they moved it to the back. And uh, we had a 1,000 watt transmitter, it went down to 250 at night. And when it went down to 250, you'd lose the signal going out of the parking lot. So you never had to really worry about what you did at night. But I'll tell you, I'll, let me tell you one quick story. So I thought my career had ended. They, I was reading a piece of AP wire copy, unrewritten, I will tell you, uh, and it talked about they were sinking uh, hulks of old ships off of the North Carolina coast, getting rid of nerve gas. So I said the following sentence, but I screwed up one of the words. You'll have to guess which one. The Navy today sank a shipload of nerve gas. <laughs> I thought my career was over. <laughs> Not one call. I said fire farters once. I thought that was the end. Charles, what about you? I, my favorite one, <laughs> when I was talking about, what was the, the name of the Woodstock Festival was the Woodstock Folk Rock Festival. Uh-oh. <laughs> and again, but again, I was, I was expecting that, that this was it. My, you know, my career was, was finished. How did it come out? <laughs> uh, well, just the way everybody thought. <laughs> oh, that's the mind's ear that you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. You don't even have to say it. You can just. But but uh, but anyway, nobody nobody cared. They, they knew it was a mistake. And, so. and mistakes are a part of. Uh, I, I said something ridiculous tonight on the news. I kind of you know stumbled on my words, and it was uh, fortunately a moment where I could just smile. And I think that is part of success. And maturity is, it's all right. We fail as we step forward and succeed. And that's one thing to pass on to any students here tonight, that don't let that get you down. Learn from it, as we all can admit we have. And, and sometimes when you make a mistake, it turns out to be more correct than saying it correctly. Because if I remember what was going on at the Woodstock Folk Rock Festival. <laughs> <laughs> What was that, Charles? <laughs> oh, they know, don't they? <laughs> Rich, um, a lot of your stories, and in fact, um, when Pope John Paul came here, uh, 1995, correct, October, and I know you were on Shepherd One, as, as the plane has been called as, at other times, too. Tell us what that has been like, being so close to a newsmaker such as him. 
it was completely crazy. You know, we, we had to get up, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning, and you, you went down to the airport, and, and, you know, it was a hurry up and wait situation. We get on the plane, and John Paul would, would come back after you were in, in the air for an hour on, on this plane. We were, the press was all the way in the back of the plane. We said he was flying Pope class. <laughs> he had a bed and the whole thing. The bed is like in Kansas City or somewhere. I don't know, they have it in a museum. I don't really understand how it got out there, but anyway, uh, he came back, uh, and they made you, there, there were Swiss guys who were part of the, the Vatican administration, and they were, let's just say, they weren't sweet and kind. Did all they right? wear the hats and the outfit on the No, plane? no, <laughs> no, so. no, not the Michelangelo outfit. <laughs> they had regular suits on, and they had guys with big guns on the plane and everything else, but they were, they said, you stay on this seat. If you move, you're off the Vatican press corps. And I said, you throw us out of the plane? He said, yes, we'll throw you out of them, whatever. <laughs> so you had to stay in exactly. So they put me in this one seat. The Pope came back, and he stood right next to me. I mean, he was a foot away. And you'll remember he had Parkinson's, and his left hand shook like this. So my right hand is on the other end of a seat back. I'm trying to hold myself in place, and he puts the left hand on the other side of the same seat. And I'm getting the Pope vibe <laughs> like this for, I don't know, five minutes, and I'm thinking to myself, this must mean something, but I'm not getting it. <laughs> and it was amazing. And so then the first, this was when I think the OJ trial was going, the OJ trial had just ended. And we knew we had to, the office was like, you have to ask him about the OJ verdict. So we designated somebody to ask about the OJ verdict. He went on for five minutes and said absolutely nothing. And we asked his spokesman afterwards, why, did, why didn't he say something? He didn't want to. <laughs> that was it. The more you don't want to, the more uh, stuff you say. <laughs> how, how difficult was it? Um, you observed so much. You certainly can't tell everything to your listeners uh, in just deciding how you were telling your stories. You know, I get, this is how we pick stories, I think, or how we pick how we do stories. You try to find the center of the story. What's going to be interesting? Mm -hmm. You know, what do people want to know? Uh, I think they wanted to know anything about what the Pope was saying at that time. I, I asked him a question. I said, why are you coming to New York, New Jersey, and Baltimore? Remember, that was the trip. Mm. He said, I have many friends there. That was the... Well, Baltimore is the oldest diocese in the country. That's right. Well, it was founded so it was by principal thing. Lord Baltimore, right? That's right. Yes, it was uh, one of the Calverts. Sort of a Catholic state or something, wasn't it? One one time, well, it, yes, Maryland, Maryland, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh. But but anyway, it's it's. Uh, I I spent enough years there, to to, uh, to under, understand about it, especially since I went to Our Lady of Lourdes <laughs> Grammar School. Nuns and priests. I had nuns and priests in my entire uh, education. I, w I went to, to Catholic grammar school. Catholic high school, junior high school, Catholic wow. high school, and a Catholic college. How are your knuckles? <laughs> <laughs> I never had a chance to try them out. <laughs> but uh, they did. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I have many fond memories of that, and sometimes I, I'm a little irritated when people just assume that every, you know, that, I know. that, that every, every nun must have, must have done that. I, I remember one time at, at, uh, at St. Thomas More High School in Philadelphia, there was a, it was a very Italian school, and there was a great big guy, Al Ciotti, who uh, was sitting just in, just in back of where I was. And Father Nelson was a, a very slim, very methodical, and beautiful speaker. He, he spoke as if he had written it previously, although, although it's just the way, the way he talked. Uh, he came up in he, the, the, the I think it was he was running detention or something at, at this particular time, and he came around from the, from the back, and Al Ciotti grabbed Ciotti by the by the hair, mm. because he was I don't know I don't know what he was doing, but it was something not, wrong. Not according to this, and, and Ciotti got up and belted him right across the face, just got out just <laughs> just like that. Wow. And we all thought that was so much for Al Ciotti. He's a, he's a good behavior. <laughs> He said, oh, I didn't know it was you. I, didn't, I thought somebody had... Uh, he said, he said I'll, I'll accept your apology, Mr. Ciotti. Mr. Ciotti. 
Well, we were all misters in those days. In high school, all of the kids were called mister. Huh. Where did that go, right? All we don't, that we don't, you don't call anybody mister anymore. No, we don't. I only got called that in algebra class, and it wasn't <laughs> because she loved me. <laughs> Could you tell us, Charles, just about how you do what you do and your and Rand Morrison and the various producers and reporters that continues to keep Sunday morning's quality so very high um, and just with you know all the demands of social media and all that kind of stuff in this fast-paced world, what continues to keep that show going in the way that it does? When Rand took over this Sunday morning, uh, I, don't, I didn't know what his approach was going to be, but he's a very, very hands-on kind of producer. He's there all the time, and he wants to see all the copy before it goes on the air, and he, and he, he decides which pieces are not good enough to go on the air on a, on a given day. So he's, the, he's definitely the boss. The other thing is that I appreciated very much is that he understood that I was doing four radio shows every day. So he, he, let, let me, he lets me attend any meetings that I want to. I don't want to do, attend any meetings. <laughs> or none of them. <laughs> so, so I usually get read in about Friday mm -hmm. about uh, what uh, what's going to be on, and then I do I, tr I do some tracking of the of the uh, inter interstitials, you know, the, the, the little things that you said, the coming ups and the, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the things that are audio only. And uh, until then, I I couldn't even answer the question, "What are you doing this Sunday?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is. It, it's very very much a producer's show, and I was already doing the broadcast. I've I'm, I've been doing it now for 20 years. Um, which is longer than than uh, Corral did it. Although everybody thinks I'm the new guy that just replaced <laughs> <laughs> Corral. But uh, he's a he's a wonderful producer. He's hired a fantastic staff. Mm -hmm. the, ev everybody knows what they're doing, and you can also ha you know be confident that if there's something that, that has been written for you to say, that it's going to turn out to be true. There is somebody who who looks at every, everything that goes on the air and fact checks it before, before you say it. They give you a little confidence. And I think also that it is, it is what we as viewers expect. It, it hasn't changed, you know, it looks the same, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. Also, you know, the things we've said, your bow ties, the way you, you don't say 2014. You say it differently. Tell us, tell us why you say things the way you want to it's say. It's partly them. because I'm so old. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not kidding. I'm 81. When I can remember people, t t you know, my parents' age, and uh, uh, would talk about what happened in 1918. Mm -hmm. They didn't say 1918, and and uh, you know they said something happened in 1902, and uh, that's how that's how you said that. And so to me, it seemed like a natural progression to say 2002 or 2001. Uh, and I figured that as, as, as you got away from the, you, you know, two th just 2000, it would get awkward to, to say 2014. And I'm right, nobody calls it 2014. There you go. Rich, you've covered many a tragedy this city has seen, sadly. When you were out there, explain to us you leave your house, you're in a car, you're on a subway, you've got a, what are your tools? How are you getting from here to there? How are you managing your own thoughts and emotion as you're reporting? Well, I think it depends a lot on, on, the, on what tragedy you're talking about. But I, I can remember covering a, a plane crash out in Long Island, driving out in the middle of the night, and I, would, I happened to know the home number of the, uh, of the chief Port Authority spokesman, so I kept dialing it and getting more information, and as uh, I really, in those days, I guess it wasn't necessarily illegal uh, to talk on your two-way radio as you drove, and I was filing reports as I got there, uh, and that, uh, that particular plane crash uh, was an odd one because the plane ran out of gas and, and uh, crashed on the North Shore of Long Island. So when I went by a nearby firehouse and the, and the fire engines were still in there, I thought it was really odd, you know? But I reported that, and it turned out to have some 
some meaning in the story. But for instance, 9-11, you know. Uh, I was home waiting to be the anchor on a primary election that never took place that night. So I'm, I'm in New Jersey, and I'm looking at the television set, and I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around what I'm looking at. I'm thinking to myself, this can't be happening. It's, can, can somebody have like, can some, somebody somehow have a special effect that's doing this and taking all the television stations, you know? And I said, no, it's gotta be happening, but could it be happening? I pulled out of the driveway and I turned the wrong way to go to New York. Now, I've been pulling out of that driveway for 25 years. So I realized I was in shock, you know? And then I drove across and the boss said, get into New York. And I said, well, they've closed everything down. How am I gonna get into New York? I don't care, just get here. All right, so I said, well, let me try the Tappan Zee Bridge. It was wide open. I drove across the Tappan Zee Bridge and then I said, well, now I'm going in. We have to, and I could see the smoke rising. From, and I, you know, you just, you just felt that story. Of course, anybody who was here knows the shock we were all in. And in I went, and I got to Irene Cornell's house, picked up Irene. We went south. Irene Cornell is a fellow reporter on, on WCBS 880. You'll notice the 88 on the mic up in the pictures. We've now, we're now 10 times the radio station we used to be. <laughs> Anyway, um, so we, we, we drove down toward, we got to a, a barricade, a police barricade in the Bronx. And I, I just I said my name and I said, Irene Cornell. And they said, okay, they waved us through. We I went drove, through that same barricade. And, and, yeah. and we drove down the, you, then you remember, we went down the west side highway. There was no other cars. Mm -hmm. It was just surreal. And then they turned you off at 158th Street. And you went up there and, and you're driving south on Broadway and there were, are waves of people walking up the street because they'd shut down all the subways. I mean, how do, you can't be prepared for that, but you're, you're already working, and, and, and we just you know, kept going. And you're reporting as you're going at yeah, some point? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And um, I just, I do remember about 9-11, I was, when, when Bush came down and was actually at ground zero a couple days later. So this is, this is a story of connections you have with law enforcement. So we are in this gigantic motorcade, and I think we're like the 40th car in the motorcade, and they have all, all the, <laughs> Tim Sheld is over here, he was there too. All, all of the Secret Service guys are in like zip-up suits, and they're all carrying the biggest guns you ever saw in your life, and we're running toward where the president is, and you're thinking, I hope, I hope they know I'm a reporter. <laughs> you, you get up, got up to the scene, and there was a cop I knew because I had interviewed mayors and governors, and, and the cop said, I want you to stand right here. I said, but the president's over there. He said, stand right here. I said, I, I said okay. So I stood right there. The president moved over. He was about five feet in front of me on the back of a fire engine, and, and remember the, the shot of his mm -hmm. holding a firefighter like that. And that cop told me where I should be. And that those, those are the kind of valued relationships you build. So you, don't, you never know where the help is going to come from or where the problem is going to arise. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you just have to be ready for anything is what it amounts to. Charles, this CBS Sunday morning, you cover the, the, the hard news this world faces, but you also give us a break. Um, and, and that has to be uh, so fortunate for us as viewers. We need that break. What we do the headlines at the beginning of the broadcast, the headlines for, for whatever that morning is. Sunday morning is mercifully news free a lot of the time, <laughs> except uh, things are happening in Europe. But by, by the time, by the time we our broadcast goes on the air, uh, things maybe are starting to happen. Mm -hmm. But if it, but anything that happens, we'll we'll go back and report important things at any time during the broadcast, and. That's why I have to stay there the whole time, <laughs> just in case something happens. Uh, you have to be ready in this business for, for pretty much uh, anything. But I think, too, the, the, there's such importance for young reporters coming up. I want to go out and cover that story, that hard story. Yes, that's part of the world we live in, but there is still an importance uh, for the feature stories, the human interest stories, the arts, nature. Which, which we know we can find on CBS Sunday morning. We have a tremendous advantage in that, in that we're in a mostly news-free area, but also that we have an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. You feed our soul. 
and we can, so a, a piece is, runs as long as it needs to run. And we, we actually will occasionally do 15 minute pieces, which is unheard of in the, in the world of television today. Um, and it, some pieces just take, the stories take longer to tell. And, and I think we think of everything that we do as a story. It's, it's funny because the, the name of this, this uh, whole effort here is about storytelling. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the, the, the uh, what, we, what, what have we always called these? I mean, they'd say, uh, uh, how many stories are you gonna get in? <laughs> They're called stories. Yeah. Each item is a story. And, and I think that's worth remembering stories are supposed to have a beginning and a middle and an end. It's hard to find that in a, in a line and a half uh, story, <laughs> story that you're doing. But you, but you have to remember that you have to, in every, every story, you have to have the who and what and where and, and, and when, and even the why occasionally. <laughs> but that takes longer than a line and a half. <laughs> but but I, I think that's, that's what we try to do. Mm -hmm. And we're blessed with Martha Teichner and, and, uh, and, and, and with Bill Geist and, and Mo Rocca and, and people who are really, really terrific storytellers, mm -hmm. Lee Cowan. Uh, and, and in fact, that I think that's, those are the people that, that, that end up being on Sunday morning because they love to tell stories yeah. and they're really good at it. To Dana's point though, you know, uh, I, I was looking at um, some comments about, about your show and, and there was a woman who said, you're a national treasure. And I, and I really do think that you are a national treasure. And I'll ask my wife about that. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not a local treasure, but a national treasure. <laughs> But anyway, I just want to mention a show that you did many years ago on the radio, and it was about Bach, and you called him the numbers man. And you started out this half-hour broadcast with some sound from a radio telescope in Puerto Rico, and I thought, where in God's name is he going with this? <laughs> and then you described how when those sounds were printed out, there were a series of numbers, and how the, the numbers represented the sounds. And then you translated that and talked about how music is a series of numbers. And then you talked about Bach, and he had, I think, 13 children or something. Yes. And how the life of those kids was reflected in his music. And then you sat down and played it. Well, I mean, it was unbelievable. Or maybe the, you didn't. The, I don't know. I was on the radio. Maybe it was. <laughs> he said, I'm crossing my hands now. He's making me cross my hands. <laughs> it, was a, it was an astounding piece. Well, I, I think... Most people don't realize just how mathematical music is. There's a, there's a book out uh, by Eleanor Manis, who used to be one of the producers on Walter Cronkite's Universe. Mm -hmm. Her family started the Manis School of Music here in, in New York. And if you, if you play, a, say, a C, my favorite key, they call it the people's key, because <laughs> it doesn't have any sharps or flats. If you, if you play both a C and then, a, and then an octave up, and you play them at the, at the exact time, you, you can't really tell whether it's one note or two that's being played. Because what makes a tone be higher or lower is the, is the number of vibrations that you have. Uh, and one octave is exactly double. And it sounds to our ears, we can, we can hear that it's so much the same sound, that, but, but it, it, it doesn't matter what the, what, what, what the note is, an octave up from that is just double. You can, you can measure it, you know, we've got oscilloscopes and stuff like, like that. Now that you, you, you know, where you, you, you can find out how many vibrations mm -hmm. it is. And so the re what you're hearing is, in harmony, is mathematics. Mathematics. It's the beauty, it's, it's the, the music of the spheres. I think there I, you see, Rich. There's the reasoning behind there's the, that there's story. The planetary and the <laughs> you, star. you mentioned. <laughs> I'm so dazzled. I don't know yeah, what to do right. next. <laughs> Charles, you mentioned uh, uh, the, that author, and one couple of people in here have handed us some questions. One asking, "What is your favorite book?" I I can't say that I have a favorite book. Okay. We have we have more books in our in our <laughs> in our apartment than anybody has a right to have. We, the, the, the living room, uh, we have 14 foot ceilings and they're books from top to bottom, except for the windows. We don't 
put any books in, <laughs> books in the windows. But there's books on the window sills. <laughs> so uh, we, I, I love books. We, co we collect books. But favorite book? I, it's like somebody asking you who's your favorite. Of the, we have five kids. Who's your favorite child? <laughs> you can't say. How about favorite story, favorite interviewee? I know that's tough. I, I, I know. I, know I, that's I really tough. favorite. Does, I've been doing this now. I've been yeah. doing Sunday morning for twenty years. I've been at CBS yeah. f uh, for forty-seven years, mm -hmm. and and several years at ABC before Wait. that. <laughs> Thank you. And then you know, as I say, ABC b before mm -hmm. that. You're warm my, up. my wife says that I have a two-tiered memory as to when anything happened. Ah. She says that it's the two tiers are yesterday and a long time ago. <laughs> 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 and uh, most of the things happened a long time ago. <laughs> Rich, favorite book, standout interviewee or story? You know, I mean, I have a few favorite books. I don't know. I guess you can't. Is it a superlative? Yeah, it's a favorite, huh? So I really mm. can't say a few. In, books that have had impact, books that have moved you. I mean, now I'm really opening it up, so. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. Well, no, I, there's, a, there's a great book, Destiny of the Republic, that I, that I uh, enjoyed. And uh, maybe I'll think of the author here shortly, or maybe Peggy will remember the author and shout it out to me. Um, Candace Millard. Candace Millard. Impressive. Well, <laughs> if it's <thank> right. <laughs> Did she just mouth it for you? <laughs> <laughs> she held up a sign. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's about James Garfield. And I hadn't give, given 10 seconds thought to James A. Garfield and in my whole life. But if you read this book, it just immerses you in knowledge about this guy who was born in a log cabin, learned how to write Latin and Greek, became a college president by the time he was 26, never wanted to be president of the United States, went out to nominate somebody else, spoke so well that the entire convention just said, we want Garfield. And he ended up getting assassinated. But he didn't die from the bullet wound. He died from the medical care. Yep. So, I mean, it's a tremendous book. Well, they, they did not have... Uh they, they did, not, did not know about germs, literally, at yeah. that time. And so they, they, they dug in with their, with their hands and pulled out the, pulled out the bullet. And, uh, and also, light was a problem. Yeah. Uh, they had to push the bed closer to the window so that, so that the doctor could see what he was doing. And he died much later. In a, in, but, but it was yeah. a, And by the way, he died at the Jersey Shore. Well, Does that hook you? Yeah. Well, speaking of reading books, reading books pages, yes, pages? Not on the uh, Kindles and all that kind of e-book stuff? Or how, how much are you guys into electronics and social media? Because I hear you say, you can find me this one What here. is she talking about? I know. <laughs> I, was, I was working out this morning at, with my, my son, who is, uh, who, who is a personal trainer. And the television set was on, and I found out something that Mark Zuckerberg had just paid $16 billion to buy a company I had never heard of. <laughs> what, what is, what, what's, what's that? That's what I asked him. I said, what's that? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. There's, there's, obviously, the man knows what he's doing. But, but it seems to me that's an awful lot of money. It used to be a lot of money anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Inflation, you know. It still is a lot of money. So you're saying you're not doing Facebook is what I'm getting out of that. That's correct. All right, I'm not gonna, <laughs> me neither, me neither. <laughs> I do hear you though on the radio, you can catch me on Twitter, this, that, the other, um, and you got a gazillion followers on CB, at CBS Sunday. I, I'm just going to take a stab. You're not the person writing, doing the tweeting. I, I read the tweets. <laughs> <laughs> I do. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a computer the in, the, uh, in, the, in the writer's room, and I'll introduce a piece, and I come in to watch it in the, in, in the writer's room, and I kind of look, 
look over there and see what people are saying about what we're doing right then. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange feeling. Sometimes you just as soon not know. Uh, that I agree <laughs> with. How about you, Rich? Yeah, at, I've, I've at, heard. Yeah, I've yeah, heard of so it. So you have yeah. one, yes. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't do Twitter. Um, and, or, or, and I thought tweet was a very odd thing to uh, name something, you know. But apparently, it's doing very well, from what I hear. <laughs> well, apparently, it used to be that watching television was a sort of solitary thing. I mean, you'd be in front of the television, maybe it'd be a couple of people, two or three people there. But people want to be in touch with other people who are watching the show, and people will, will, will respond to what, the, to what the previous <laughs> tweet was. And uh, They call it retweet or something, right? Is that right? I think so, yeah. Could, could I'd be. like to detweet myself. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, some of the stuff that is being said, is, it, it pleases you very much. Mm -hmm. they'll, mm -hmm. they'll say nice things about the show, and mm -hmm. about here I am with my you know, with my morning coffee and my, my English muffin and, and, and Sunday morning. And you, you, yeah, you get that sense. Someone is really right there with you and... That's, a, that's another great... Th I, I mentioned the fact that we have an hour and a half. But also, Sunday morning has a certain character to it. People are probably in their, still in their bathrobes and slippers and, and they probably have the, I don't know, the New York Times uh, in, in sections. The puzzle's out. My wife always asked for the book section. Mm -hmm. I always asked for the sports section. And uh, except that I'm 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 not there on Sunday mornings anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're really missing a great program. <laughs> 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 but but with 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 news gathering, um, these things, tweets, and. Uh, what do you call them, handles, are, have become a part of, of news. Do you not feel rich, I guess, more? No, absolutely. I think I mean, it's you got to, you know, you, you got to join it in a way. Right. Yes? But it's a way to it's a way to get news, too. A lot of things come over Twitter mm -hmm. now with the a hashtag. Where does a word like hashtag come from? That's you know? that tic-tac-toe thing. Right? I know, but that's what I thought of. <laughs> hashtag. I, I thought, first of all, they were talking about drugs. I didn't. <laughs> Is that a brand name? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if somebody's making a lot of money, if it is. Yeah, that's for definite. That is for definite. But I, you know, I'm, I really think that people are now speaking differently, talking differently, now that, now that they're communicating this way. And there are all these, the, these shortcuts, that and the, all the OMGs mm. and, and that. I can't even, there's a word for it, for the little faces that you make. And you, yeah. know, you, make, you make us. You, Emo emoti? Emoticon, yeah, that's oh, it. That's something, it. yeah. But, uh, and I think people are writing differently now. Writing less? Sometimes writing less. And I, I find some, sometimes on the front page of the New York Times, you have to go halfway down the column before you come to a verb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, it's like what Mark Twain said about, uh, about the German language. He said, the German language is like a dog jumping into a lake on one side of the lake and staying submerged and emerging on the other side with a verb in his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> the, the love of language. I mean, and I agree with you. We, we go through periods in our news, I have to say, where people start dropping the to, do, to be verb. Police chasing man in red car, you know. No, police are chasing. Um, is there sort of a, an embracing and a... Um, trying to encourage younger people, Rich, to, to not throw this language away, to use this language. Um, tell, me, tell me what you well, tell young students. I think language is a living thing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in some ways, it, uh, it lives well and, and in good society, and sometimes it gets down in the curb a little bit, I think, you know? And um, I, th I think that there are very colorful things that are said sometimes that you can't use on the radio, that maybe you'd like to. Um, Language, is, is it descending into some sort of chaos? I don't think so, because um, although it's changing, and, and people use, always use hipper and cooler words, and, and I try to listen to them and try to use them, because you try to, you know, you try to go along with the program a little bit, at least. If, but, you, get, if, you, but, get, if you get caught doing that, though, later, later on, when that word becomes passe, you, you sort of date yourself. 
That's right. I, I, you mean I, I'm not hip after all? I, no, but I, I remember there was a, there was a, my father had picked one up that, that I can remember when it was in. People said, oh, that's really George. And we're not talking about any presidents. <laughs> but, but was that, that but cool? He, but he would say it. They would say, George, George is cool? That's cool? Yeah, the George was good in those days. Oh, all right. But, George. But, but the, the hashtag thing, George, right? We can start <laughs> this now. I, I, don't know, I don't know whether hashtag is going <laughs> to be around all, all, that, all that long. But, it may, I mean, we're a very of the, of the moment kind of medium. Mm -hmm. both, both radio and television are. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on some of the wonderful things that we know how wonderful they are, they were, uh, sometimes it's surprising to see what what, what was actually ha happening there for, for using today's uh, standards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, I'm, uh, I, sometimes you, you listen to I mean, really, really great broadcasters like Morrow or Collingwood or something like that, and you realize we wouldn't do that anymore. And it's not just because we don't, we don't even know what those words mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but language does change. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes short and sweet is, is, is good. Mm -hmm. What do you tell students, Rich, uh, who want to report? I mean, as far as writing, oral language, I mean, what, are there any pieces of advice that well, are constants? For yeah, you know, I, you mentioned Morrow, and I, I can remember listening to a report he did from a rooftop in London, and, it, and I thought to myself, what, what did he just do? What, and what he did, uh, he was talking, he said, he was talking about uh, the anti-aircraft fire, which was over on the horizon, and he said, there's a small orange flash on the horizon, and you'll soon hear the report from it. Let's listen. Put a doom. And you just said, wow, he brought me there. You know, he told me what it was like to be on that roof in London in World War II, and I thought, what did, what did he really say? He just described exactly what he saw. So if you're doing an on-scene report and you're trying to back into the whole backstory of whatever the story is, that's a mistake because you get all tangled up in the details and you lose the present moment. If you just talk about that moment and say, you know, you've got a, a guy coming out of a courthouse or something, you say, well, he's being jostled now, the, the cops have, you know, his, his hands are behind his back, he's being, did you, did you do it? Did you, ah, get out of my, you know. <laughs> now you've got this, you got the sense of what's going on. You don't have to say that he was charged with, uh, you know, first degree murder or some, you know, you're doing the moment and you're just taking a picture, to your point, about the visual medium and putting it in the minds of the listener. It's great if you know what's going to happen. If he saw enough artillery in his, in his uh, yeah. anti-aircraft right. to know that it would take a few seconds for the sound to get there, because light is faster than sound. Right. Uh, I, I did uh, some, some space shots, and what, the most wonderful thing that I have ever yeah. had the experience of doing, that NASA would give you a timeline so that you, you, you would say, you could just look at, look at the watch, okay, this, this is liftoff. And you could say, where are we now? I think we should be having separation about now. We have separation. <laughs> You said, boy, well, that guy really knows a lot about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Can I tell you a Pope story that I didn't, haven't got? All right. Yes. So 1979, and in those days, uh, they had security, but it wasn't anything like it is now. So I'm standing behind a blue police barricade on 51st Street next to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Now, John Paul, at that time, He's like 59 years old, and he's, he's like an athletic, uh, he's a skier, you know, and he's, he's walking around, he's not the John Paul you saw at the end, he's walking around St. Patrick's Cathedral, there's a little walkway around the cathedral, and he's doing his patented, looking up at what he would later call skyscrapers. <laughs> and he's walking toward me, uh, and I'm describing, you know, the, the Pope now with his patented two-handed, and the, and the Holy Father, now the crowds are cheering, and he's holding his right hand up, he's waving his left hand now, and he keeps walking toward me, and I thought, wow, he's going to turn into the church, but he didn't. He kept walking toward me, and now he is about a foot away, and he turns to me, and he winks. 
I was frozen. Did you say? Do did I you just say? Winked at me? Do, did I, did, that's what went. Do I say? The poop just winked at me. I thought I'm going to sound like an idiot. So I said, the Pope just winked at me. Did you say? Ba I did. Yeah. And back at the radio station, they were falling on the floor. <laughs> did the mayor wink at you? <laughs> did the police commissioner wink at you? No, the Pope. <laughs> the Pope winked at me. I had, I had a papal experience of my own. With Pope, Top uh, that, Paul. right? That sounds like a song, doesn't it? Pope Paul VI visited the United States, right. visited New York. 65, right? No, it was 1960. It was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Not 1865. <laughs> but anyway, they had some, somebody had sent uh, a, a priest to, to to explain what was going on with me. This was when I was at ABC, but I, they knew that I had been to Fordham and that I, you know, had five kids and all that. They said, let, let him uh, be. The, <laughs> so, uh, so the priest turned out to be Father Tim Healy, who became. Later on, he became the, the president of Georgetown. In fact, I, 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 again, I'm mixed up in time. However, Healy uh, w was explaining the, you know, the, the theological and uh, liturgical significance of what, what was going on. But it was being done on a baseball field. And uh, I, I had known him because he used to do the mass, say the mass at the Blue Chapel sometimes. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, anyway, he, he says, uh, you know, His Holiness is now uh, rounding third. <laughs> and, <laughs> and headed for the uh, home plate. I said, Father, he's not going to slide. <laughs> <laughs> Observations. <laughs> One of the things um, one of our audience members has observed of CBS Sunday Morning, wondering if the nature um, segment isn't the right word, but it's, it's in TV talk, it's a bump out to the commercial uh, with no audio track, correct? Is it just the sounds? Is it shorter than it used to be? One of the things people like best about the nature segment is that the anchorman finally shuts up. <laughs> It's a moment of peace and serenity. Birds and <laughs> yes. tweeting. And the natural sound that goes yes. with it. Every so often somebody would say, you know what would go with nicely with that is the, uh, some, some piece by WC or whatever. So we, we don't do that. You just hear what you, what you hear. Mm. It is for us, because, because it's very hard to time an hour and a half show and to know 10 minutes in or 15 minutes in whether you're running long or running, running short. Interviews mm -hmm. sometimes take a little longer. Sometimes you're off. However, the nature scene is a great accordion for us. If, if we're short, you get a nice long <laughs> nature. <laughs> right. If we're long, well, we, we try not to do any less than, than 45 seconds. Uh -huh. But we don't always succeed. <laughs> in that. So you, you, the, the, the editor who puts this together is, is trying to have it make sense. Everything has to, oh, that's a, an important thing about storytelling, is that, is that if you don't know the meaning of what you're saying, don't say it. <laughs> and that happens all the time. People are rewriting wire stories and whatever, and they say, why did you use that word? Well, it, that, that's what it said on AP. You know. <laughs> so, no, if, you don't, if you don't know it, then find some other way to say it or ask somebody what it it's, means. You, you don't. Don't say anything that hasn't passed through your brain mm -hmm. first with a certain amount of, of understanding. I mean, if, you know, it's a very, if it's a very simple phrase that everybody knows what it means, no problem. Which is another reason to use, uh, to follow the uh, strunk and white standards of, mm. you know, use, use short words, yes. short sentences. Uh, and if you separate the, the subject from the verb too much, the audience will not know what you're talking about. The Germans will, though, right? <laughs> well, it'll already be out there. On, uh... But part of that, the step before that, uh, which another audience member has asked, and Rich just addressing, what, why do we put the stories on the air that we put on the air anyway? Um, who, who makes those decisions? Are you involved in those decisions? No, the guys down there I know, I see them. involved in those decisions. <laughs> I see them. Come on up and explain all of this. <laughs> I think, you know... I'll, I'll, Do you have input? 
Well, yeah, I think we, we do. We, and, and we have a very um, a great system uh, at the radio station. We actually talk to each other and, uh, and, and make decisions collaboratively, which I think is, um, in some places, isn't done, you know. But uh, uh, it's really good because you try to figure out, you know, some, some stories are every man stories. I mean, uh, as uh, Lou Adler once said years and years ago, who was a news director of WCBS prior to, to Tim, um, you can never do enough weather. Well, you know, it's pretty obvious that weather affects everybody, and obviously if you're going to have a, a sandy or you're going to have a big snowstorm, that you're going to hear that's going to be the lead, you know. Uh, but when it gets beyond that, then, it, then it's a judgment call. How many people would really be interested in this story? Is, is it a fascinating story standing on its own? Uh, you know, I mean, it's all judgment call, you know. Charles, you wanted to say something about this that someone here oh, yes. gave you tonight. Yes, a gentleman, uh, Robert Carley, gave me this, and it had some things written down here. I'll hold it he for did, you. Would you like he, me to hold it? He, he did this, and that's me. Uh, <laughs> and he also he wrote down things that I had said, and I thought I'd bring it out on the stage with me in case I couldn't remember anything that I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I said that one a long time ago. Politically correct. Uh, what else? What you've said about ignorance with some of us, while some of us may know more than others about certain things, it is the thinnest slice of all that is or could be known. In that sense, we are all profoundly ignorant. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? That's very, very nice. Wit and wisdom of Charles Osgood. Well, I'm, th th those sound nice when you... I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. You know, one of the things He's I used to having somebody else hold his mic, let's face it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that happens when I, when I visit WCBS because usually the microphone is attached to, <laughs> to me. I can't lose it. But uh, I, I forget to talk into the microphone sometimes. But it's only, you know, it's, I've only been doing this for about <laughs> 60 years. <laughs> but... Uh, Somehow, if, if, if I can actually see the audience, I feel as if they don't, I don't need to talk into this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something that also people ask sometimes is, if you know that you know, a couple of million people are listening to what you, what you say, mm -hmm. does, that, does that affect you? Yeah, does it make you nervous? Does it make you um, worry, regret afterwards? Well, of course, number one, you hope that there's a lot of people out there listening and, and watching. But what I try to do is to talk to one person. And I can tell you who that person is. My sister and I are what we call Irish twins. Uh, we were born in the same year. I was born in January, and she was born in December of, of 1933. And I grew up with her. We, we, we remained in touch. Uh, she, lives, she lives in Virginia. Uh, but I, I, I imagine that what I'm saying, I'm saying to her. I'm saying it to somebody that I like, love, and, I, and, and know. And, and, and I, I would not want to ever yell at her or offend her or anything. She is, she is a perfect person for me to choose as somebody to talk to. She, it's also very reassuring mm. to know that... that she that, likes you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I think that's a good thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little tip I, I will give to people who mm. are, you know, trying to... TV voice. You, TV voice and mm. uh, that kind of thing. And right, right, mm -hmm. you know. Just talk to somebody. Just talk, talk to them. And, talk, and, and the person you're talking to is, is somebody that you care about and respect. And it also, it allows us to be us. The easiest person for me to be is me. Sure. And that means I'm focusing more on making sure what I'm saying, what we're reporting, is accurate, is both sides, is the best writing I could give, the best sound bites. And that's I how you get people, and people will trust you if you, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's the, you know, if, if you're, if you're, I know, I, I, I'm not going to name any names, but there are people you see on television who clearly think that they're smarter than the audience. And, and it's, it's, <laughs> talk, who are those talk people? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think that, at least in the case of the of the WCBS 
audience and the and the and the, uh, the, the, the Sunday morning audience that the audience is smarter than you. I think that's another thing. I, my, my little sister, who's almost exactly the same age as me, uh, is, is a very smart person. And I, and I know that if I, if I, if I think otherwise, uh, I'd, be, I'd be making a big mistake. <laughs> I have always thought exactly the same thing, only I thought I was the first one to think about it. Of talking to one person? No, no, not that, that the audience is smarter. Oh, okay. You know, we have so many people out there who are so well educated, uh, you know, and are, have their doctorates and, and who teach the English language uh, and who know about literature and history. And, uh, and if you're mispronouncing something, they're going to know it. I'm a, <laughs> speaking of your earlier point about you should also always see the copy and, and know about it before. Somebody handed me a piece of copy. I was at a a radio station in Detroit, WNIC, it was four o'clock in the morning, and they handed me this bulletin that had just come across. And Henry Ford had fired the president of the Ford Motor Company. And I said that Lee Yakaka had been fired. <laughs> the general manager was on the phone in about five minutes. Iacocca, you idiot. <laughs> the last time I read a piece of cold copy without actually looking at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Control what you can control. Right. And, and yes. you know, that's pre-reading what we do and making sure we are as prepared as, as we can be to do the best job. And I think that's also the rush of it all, doing live, live reports, live television. The pressure is, I like that. You, you still like doing it, Charles? Oh, yeah. It sure, yeah. Be, sure beats working for a living. Yeah, no, I mean, but that's so <laughs> That's important. what we all thought. Don't, you know, but yes, you love it. it it's, it's very nice, and especially if you're associated with a show like, like Sunday morning, uh, and people will, will stop say, I love, I, I love your show. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an opportunity to say, well, it's not all me. It's, you know, there's a lot of people that are all very, very t talented people. But I don't say that. I say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, Rich, we know your voice. But yes, you know, there's yeah. an anonymity associated yeah. with radio that is sometimes quite advantageous. Uh, I, I, we have walked down the street with, uh, with Charles and with, uh, I can remember walking down the street with Gabe Pressman. Now, you walk down the street with Gabe Pressman in New York, everybody in every garage is yelling, Gabe, how are you, Gabe? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm invisible, you know, that's, and then Jerry Nackman used to say the great thing about radio is that you could file for radio in the nude, in, in your bedroom, while drinking a Yoo-Hoo. <laughs> If you, knew, some if you knew do Jerry, that? if you I knew know, Jerry, I work for Jerry Nackman. <laughs> if you knew Jerry Nackman, that picture isn't a pretty one. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> May he rest in peace. Yes. Yes. God bless him. He was brilliant, by the way. Yeah. I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever told you this before, but I, a long time ago, uh, Walter Cronkite. Uh, I used to play tennis with Walter. That was, that that was. Uh, one of the sort of side benefits of, of, mm. of working early in the morning. I was finished, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he would like to play tennis before. He, and so the, 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 the foursome was uh, Andy Rooney. See, you can see the quality tennis players on, on <laughs> top Did he make funny comments during the... I'm Andy Rooney, and I just don't like your <laughs> racket or something. Well, he would, what, what he would, would do is, I mean, if, you, if, you, if, if for a change, a serve went in, he would say, you're holding your racket different, aren't you? you know, it, it's, that, it's that old, that, the business he starts you thinking about holding your racket. And then you, it's you, playing you, with your mind, you know, right? Like, that is playing with your mind. You know? <laughs> but anyway, what, Cron what Cronkite said to me was, huh? what Cronkite said to me was, there's a guy on WCBS who sounds like you. And I said, really? He said, yes, his name is Rich Lamb. <laughs> so I said, well, that's some nerve. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> well,
Well, that's uh, amazing. Um, you know, I, I have to tell you, just sitting next to Charles Osgood, this, this guy is like on, from down from Mount Olympus just to say hello to us. I mean, uh, you are such an icon in the business. You have been one of my heroes for so long that it's beyond my belief that I'm sitting here on a stage with you just joking around mm -hmm. and telling silly stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, was also, it was also Rich who, since he comes from Hartford, uh, was, th was there when I was making an appearance and I played the banjo. And afterwards, Rich called me up and suggested a banjo teacher that he knew. <laughs> so that wasn't too, too Olympian a... Uh... <laughs> well, I, I would like to say I am extremely uh, in awe of both of you. So nervous to the point that that's why I forgot to introduce your video at the beginning because I was like, oh my God, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, was on a children's show for eating my spinach. And that was my first time on TV when I was four. And here I am um, with both of you, whom I respect so very much and who hold the bar so high for those of us every single day. And I, I hope you both know that. And, and, and you inform us and you entertain us and you are our eyes as and your words are our words as you tell your stories, and we're very, very grateful. Right back at you, Dan. Yeah, I was gonna say. Thank you. Thank you. We're about to wrap up. Thank you, Charles. Any final thoughts you would like to? I, I think share? We, we opened with, this, with, the, with the notion that it, it, uh, it's all storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, Nora Ephron used to say, because she worked in the newspaper before she, in That's fact, she right, worked when Jean was at work for the newspaper. <laughs> it's all copy. Stuff that happens to you is all fair game. And when, when she did that, it turned out to be great movies. <laughs> but, I, but I think that you, should, you should talk about what you know. You should hesitate to talk about what you don't know. And you should tell it as if it's a story, sort of in sequence. Uh, and just, just the, tell the story as if something happened to you on the way home and you want to tell your wife about it and you, just the way you would tell it then. Mm -hmm. You don't say, three people were killed in a car crash today. On, so you, you would find some better way to start it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Rich? Gee, I wish I had some overarching advice to give you. Only that, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say uh, that it's, it's a tough business. It's a, let me tell you. It's a great business. You will have experiences that you can't possibly have anywhere else. You're, you know, Stan Brooks, the great late Stan Brooks, used to say that being in the business was like being on the 50-yard line of life, and absolutely the best seat. You'll see, you know, you will have flown on a pope's plane. You would have felt a pope vibe. I mean, <laughs> you would have had a pope wink at you. I mean. Where are you going to get experiences like that? It's, it's amazing the things that you'll see and do. Mayors will know your name. I mean, you'll be, able, you'll be in rooms with presidents. I went over and got an autograph from Ronald Reagan for my, my nephew, and it's hanging in his office. He's a lawyer now. He can be a little kid then. I mean, the things that you see and do, the people with whom you can associate. Everyday people, too. Everyday people, you have such a wonderful opportunity to meet and speak with them as well. The, the microphone is a passport into everybody's life. Mm -hmm. And, and you, can, you can talk to anybody. And it's really surprising what you'll hear from them. I mean, you will have startling things. You, you go out expecting what you can expect, whatever you want. But you may not come back thinking the same thing. People will change your mind. And, and it's, an, it's an extraordinary experience. It's like... I don't know. It's like living life in the fast lane all the time and never hitting it. Uh, you know, an you know. Coral, I, I think I learned a lot from Coral just by w watching him work, and 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 he was he was a great storyteller. But he used to say, if if nobody ever asked him to cover a news conference because there are fifty other people covering that same news conference, he wanted to talk to people, that just ordinary people, and he he said that we we like to do stories where the the people would welcome you back. They'd like to see you again. And that's not always true with us 
report, real reporter. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody has a story, and we thank you both for sharing yours with us tonight. Can I add one little thing? You brought just one more little note here. Hang on, I don't mean to kill the applause. You can do that later. Um, you mentioned Keralt, and Keralt, uh, you know, we all, we're, we're, we love our words. The people who are up here love their words. Keralt was a great wordsmith, and I just remember his definition of unique. He said, unique can't be modified. It stands alone in the universe. That's right. Charles Osgood is unique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, SAG Foundation.